Ferguson, Chief Operating Officer with Action on Smoking and Health, and I'll be moderating our program today. We're delighted to host Dr. Brian King, Director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products, and Mark Meany, Director of the Commercial Tobacco Control Program at the Public Health Law Center. Welcome, Dr. King and Mr. Meany. Thank you both for being here. So we're here today to talk about tobacco product regulation at the international, federal, and state levels. ASH engages at each of these levels in order to maximize the pressure on governments to work to end the tobacco epidemic rather than just mitigate it. As many of you know, ASH employs a human rights-based approach to tobacco policy. It's well-established that the marketing and selling of tobacco products violates the right to health, and governments have a duty under international law to stop the tobacco industry. Some of the policies and potential policies we'll discuss today will help push us in the right direction. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. King and Mr. Meany about tobacco product regulations because they impact not only ASH's work, but the important work of many of you joining us today. Now, before we begin, I'd like to encourage you all to submit your questions throughout the program. Please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I believe that we had over 950 participants register today, so please forgive us if we aren't able to get to every single question, but we'll absolutely do our best. I should mention, too, that ASH Managing Attorney Kelsey Romeo Stuppy will also be joining the following the presentations for the Q&A session to, to assist where she can. And with that, I'd like to move into our first presentation. We're pleased to welcome you, Dr. King, and thank you so much again for being here. Great. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate the intro and also the opportunity to speak today. Um, as I start to share my slides, um, I just want to reinforce and commend to you all um, uh, the uh, importance of the session and framing. And I like the notion around international, national, and state. And I think it really reinforces the hallmark of tobacco control for decades. Um, and really focusing on a comprehensive approach um, that's occurring at multiple levels. And it's not any one panacea. Um, but ultimately that coordinated collaborative approach that's been so effective um, for many decades and will certainly continue moving forward. Um, that said, today I'm primarily going to focus on that federal lane. Um, that is, is where I am housed. Um, and so here's a brief agenda where I hope to take you over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, uh, first, just going over the current landscape of tobacco products to prime um, uh, the discussion of the overview of the Center for Tobacco Products, and then provide some programmatic updates from the Center, um, including on some key areas of impact Port, um, where we are, are taking various actions. And then also importantly, looking ahead, you know, where we've been is important, but also where are we going um, are, are equally as, as important. So I'll start with the tobacco product landscape, which I hope many folks are already well versed in. Um, we have made monumental progress um, in the United States in reducing cigarette um, uh, consumption over the past more than and half century, which I would argue is one of the uh, most greatest public health accomplishments um, over the past century. We started to see this decline in the mid 60s with the Surgeon General's reports um, started to be issues and we've seen subsequent decline since that point. And it was ultimately the result of a coordinated approach, but particularly those population based interventions. Um, that we were implementing, which ultimately primed the population um, uh, to educate them not only on the risks of tobacco product use, but also importantly, um, to implement levers and um, interventions to effectively um, prevent and reduce that use. Um, that said, where are we um, in the United States? Well, we have about 11.5% um, of, of U.S. adults who are smoking cigarettes. It's certainly a far cry from the 40 plus percent um, that we saw back in the 50s, um, but cigarettes are far and away the most commonly used product. They're also responsible for the overwhelming burden of death and disease from tobacco use in the United States. And that's why a bulk of the focus of, of many of the items I'll talk to you today about, including product standards, are focused on those combustible products. About 75% of adult tobacco users are using um, cigarettes. Um, but we also know the landscape is diversifying. Um, and we do see a lot of a variety of different products, as you can see on this slide, that are being used by American adults. It's also important to note um, that we have prominent youth use as well, particularly for e-cigarettes. Um, and this um, demonstrates a bit of a roller coaster ride um, that we've been on uh, for e-cigarettes over the years. Um, we did peak that red line at the top in 2019, um, where over 5 million youth were using e-cigarettes. The good news is that we are down. We are less than half from that peak, um, but it's still far too many kids using those products. But you can see compared to e-cigarettes and the other products, um, far and away the most commonly used product and has been since 2014. Um, but it's a 
good reminder that what we don't want to be doing is playing a game of public health whack-a-mole when it comes to tobacco product use among kids. Um, we've made good progress in the past couple of years, and we hope to see that continue. But what's working against us, the rapidly dynamic nature of the landscape. And I provide this slide just to demonstrate how quickly it can move. Um, when we're talking e-cigarettes, it's not years, um, and it's not even months sometimes, it's actual weeks. Um, where you see shifts in the marketplace and entry of new products, which we also um, uh, see um, corresponding increases in youth use um, when we do see those youth appealing products um, increase in sales. That said, it's a very diverse landscape with a lot of players, which complicates the ability to, to regulate. That said, where do we come in in terms of regulation? Well, I want to start in the broader global context, and I'm sure folks are aware of the um, uh, empower model from our colleagues at the World Health Organization, which articulates a variety of proven evidence-based data-driven strategies that we know work to effectively prevent and reduce tobacco use. Um, and you'll note that many of these are also um, occurring um, at the, the domestic level here in the United States. Um, I will say that there's no single right or wrong way to regulate tobacco products. It's been done a lot of different ways across the, the world. But that said, in the United States, um, we do um, what Congress has afforded us to do. And so frequently I get flack from folks, saying, well, why don't you do this or why can't you do that? I mean, my response is go back to the Tobacco Control Act. And I am legally required to implement the statutes um, as afforded by Congress back in 2009. Um, importantly, as a part of our regulatory authorities, CTP, or the Center for Tobacco Products, has been working since 2009 to regulate um, uh, tobacco products in the United States. I do remind folks that we're a relatively young center. We're still in our adolescence. Um, so there's been centers that have been around for over 100 years um, at FDA, and they've already implemented those foundational rules, and then they can continue to build on those and moving forward. In terms of the Center for Tobacco Products, we're still in the process of building those foundational rules, many of which I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, but part of our authorities involved deeming um, products to bring them under our jurisdiction. We did that in 2016, um, including for e-cigarettes. Um, and importantly, in 2022, an important loophole was closed in the United States. The initial Tobacco Control Act gave us authority authority um, uh, to uh, regulate um, uh, products containing nicotine um, that were derived from the tobacco plant. At that point, most um, nicotine was derived from the tobacco plant because that was a very inexpensive way to get it and extract it. But over time, we did see people pivot to um, lab-based synthetic nicotine, um, which we call non-tobacco nicotine as an all-inclusive term, um, to attempt to circumvent the law. Um, that said, Congress closed that loophole in April of last year, and now FDA does have the authority over all products containing um, uh, nicotine that are um, tobacco products irrespective of, of the source of that nicotine. Um, that said, what do we do? Well, um, the Center for Tobacco Products um, regulates the manufacturing, marketing, and sale of tobacco products. Those are the specific standards that we've been afforded um, by the U.S. Congress. So we can do a lot of things. Um, Pre-market review of applications we're required to do. We do post-market surveillance. We can do product standards. I'm going to tell you a lot about these things um, in my um, subsequent presentations. Um, uh, slides, and we also do um, harmful and potential harmful constituent reporting of, of products and also things like warning labels. So there's a lot of things that are afforded to us, but there's certain things that we don't have the authority to do. And some of those are listed on this slide, including things like setting price, um, regulating therapeutic products um, like nicotine replacement therapies. That is not done by the Center for Tobacco Products. That's done by our colleagues at CEDAR at FDA. Things like smoke-free laws um, and also changing the minimum purchase of tobacco products. That's something Congress has to do. We ultimately can help implement it, but there's certain things we do not have the authority to do. Um, that said, an important component of the Tobacco Control Act is that there is no preemption um, uh, largely for states and local communities to implement strategies that are um, similar to or more rigorous than the Tobacco Control Act. And so there's a lot of latitude for states to take action on things um, that FDA doesn't have authority on or um, you know, to complement those ongoing works. And there's some great examples of that, including Tobacco 21, um, flavored restrictions, um, uh, and also things that FDA can't do like smoke-free laws and taxation. And so it gets to my point earlier around the importance of a comprehensive approach um, that is ultimately coordinated and complementary to ensure that we're broaching all of those important levers for tobacco control for many decades. We've always seen things galvanized from the bottom up. T21 is a great example where you had Needham, Massachusetts back in the early 90s implementing the policy and still you saw locally salient data drive um, the innovation and also public perspectives that ultimately led to a broader nationwide tobacco 20 policy thereafter. That's not to say that there's not opportunity for the government, the federal government to go first, and there's certainly some opportunities for that in the imminent future. Um, but I will say um, that that comprehensive approach is key. 
That said, what does the Center for Tobacco Products do? There's four main things I'm gonna walk you through today. Um, first is reviewing tobacco product applications. We do have a pre-market tobacco paradigm in the United States. Again, it's not something that I thought up in my basement. It's something that Congress told us we had to do. And so we are implementing the law. Um, we also do enforcement and compliance. Um, we do educate the public about the risks of tobacco products. And we also implement um, rules and guidances as well. So I wanna start with rules and guidances um, to walk you through where we are at present. Um, so there's a long torturous process um, for implementing what we call product standards, um, as well as um, guidances. And it involves us first proposing these to the public. Um, and then we get public comment. Um, and then we also um, then um, finalize it depending on what those comments are. And that can take many years. Um, frequently, people will say, well, why don't you implement this rule or this guidance? And my response is that it takes many years in the federal process. It's, it's very easy to criticize um, from the cheap seats when you have nothing to risk and nothing to do. But the complexities of being in the belly of the beast and actually implementing it is far more complicated. Um, that said, we have um, released uh, many rules and guidances since the center has been implemented, um, including um, 35 um, draft guidances and over 50 final level one guidances, as well as 16. Um, uh, uh, proposed rules um, and 17 final. Um, that said, or reverse, 17 proposed, 16 final. Um, and, and that's the result of a coordinated work by our, our civil servants. We have over 1,100 staff working for many years um, to implement those. That said, we're still in those formative stages, getting those foundational rules. And part of that is the first product standards coming out from the Center for Tobacco Products. And those um, are um, currently proposed that are we working to finalize to prohibit menthol in cigarettes and also to prohibit characterizing flavors in cigars. Um, I have been saying um, since very early this year that we intend to finalize those by the end of this year. Um, we are on track to do so. Um, I know there's been a little bit of a distraction around the unified agenda in the United States, particularly around August. I'll say that that is not um, a precise estimate of when we are going to finish. It's very much an estimate as any agenda is, and it's not set by FDA. Um, that said, the administration is very supportive of, of finalizing um, uh, these rules. We have stated that many times, and we're committed to finalizing them in the coming months. That says there, there's a long process that has to be followed, including review of public comments on these rules. And so we got over 250,000 um, for these two alone, and that takes time to review and to do right. Um, and so that's what we're doing, and we're committed to finishing them um, as soon as possible. Um, I do take umbrage with folks criticizing um, the amount of time that's occurring um, since the public comment. Um, and I will say that the suggestion that the agencies are dragging our heels is not only disingenuous, but misinformed and also an insult to the civil servants who have been working for over a year on this issue. And so we're committed to get it done. It's a priority of the administration. We're going to get there. That said, it's not the only thing we've got in our queue. We're not one trick ponies. We're moving multiple product standards forward. We have announced our intent to um, propose a rule to cap the maximum level of nicotine in cigarettes and certain other combustible products. Um, that uh, is uh, something that we have announced our intent to propose and we are working on. We intend to follow the uh, product standards that we're finalizing right now on menthol and flavored cigars to include um, that nicotine product standard. Now let's move on to application review. So this is something else that seems to get a lot of attention and rightfully so. In the United States, we have a pre-market tobacco product review paradigm. Um, we have multiple mechanisms where if someone wants to sell a tobacco product, they have to submit an application and FDA will authorize it. We have a pre-market tobacco product application um, uh, or PMTA um, line where before you can legally sell the product, you have to get it authorized. We also have a substantial equivalence align where if you demonstrate your product is the same as something that's already on the market, you can sell it. And also um, an exception from an NSC request for very minor changes um, for a product. That said, um, you don't have to go through this product, uh, this process if you have what we call a pre-existing tobacco product. And so something that was on the market before 2007. Um, uh, that said, um, there's a certain product classes that fall within this. There's no e-cigarette that falls within that. So um, for the most part, every, every e-cigarette um, has to go through um, uh, the PMTA um, process unless um, it has um, a, an approval as a therapeutic, which, which no device does. That said, there's a variety of different channels, um, but for e-cigarettes, which um, tend to get the most attention, those are coming through um, the PMTA um, route. Um, in terms of what FDA does when we're reviewing these applications, we do not approve anything. Um, and that's because there's no safe tobacco product. 
other centers um, such as drug evaluation, um, they are approving a, a drug device because the standard there is safe and effective. You have to show that um, the, the drug is going to be safe to use, but also that it effectively does what it wants to do. Well, when you're thinking about tobacco products where there's no safe of tobacco product, well, how could that be um, you know, effective? Effective at what? Um, uh, but we authorize tobacco products. Um, and um, that, again, is something that's afforded um, to us by the Tobacco Control Act. And instead of a safe and effective standard, we have what we call appropriate for the protection of public health, or APPH. Um, and that was, again, afforded to us by Congress. And we have to weigh the net benefits and risks of a tobacco product. And so, for example, for a PMTA, for an e-cigarette, that would be weighing the risks of the products, which is normally um, prominent use among youth, um, and the extent to which youth are using those products weighed with the benefits, which in that case, um, and that example would be an adult smoker using e-cigarettes to transition completely away um, from conventional cigarettes. And so we weigh those benefits and risks, and that's how we make a determination around whether a product is authorized or not. Um, that said, I know that the agency gets a lot of attention around, well, we're reviewing the applications, what's taking so long? Well, um, I'll show you the volume um, shortly, but there's also a very detailed process to make sure that our approach is legally and scientifically defensible. And so we assess every application um, on a variety of different indicators, and it's a multidisciplinary uh, review, several of which you can see on the slides here. And in terms of volume alone for e-cigarettes, we've received 26 million. Um, and so we have um, gotten through 99% of those and are committed to finalizing the 1%. Um, in terms of authorization, we've authorized 23 e-cigarettes. Those are all tobacco flavored. Um, that's primarily because we know that um, youth use of e-cigarettes remains prominent on um, particularly flavored varieties. And so those tobacco flavored are lower appeal to youth. And so um, there's that lower bar um, to um, uh, document the net benefit for adult smokers relative to the risk among youth. That said, we have issued negative decisions for millions of, of, of other products. And um, we're committed to getting that 1% done, but I will say um, that we want to make sure that we do it right. Um, and that includes for both marketing denial orders and granting orders, we have to take the time to make sure it is scientifically and legally defensible. Otherwise, we are going to face litigation from either end on people that agree or disagree with it. And so that's a critical component of our portfolio. So now let's transition to compliance and enforcement. So we've got that pre-market review paradigm. And once we get through those 26 million applications, I am confident we are going to get back to a pre-market review paradigm, but when you're um, thrust with 26 million applications at once, um, coupled with another million um, from synthetic products, um, once they closed that loophole last year, um, it's a lot to get through, um, but we are hopeful that soon we will get over that hump and get back um, to the appropriate pre-market um, review paradigm. In the meantime, we have not let up on compliance and enforcement. We have a broad portfolio in terms of first assuming admirable intent and educating the people we regulate about um, uh, maintaining compliance. Clients, um, or they face enforcement. We do investigations um, across the country through multiple levers. And then importantly, if people are not complying with the law, we do implement enforcement actions. We um, do have authority over a variety of folks in the supply chain, from manufacturers to importers to distributors and retailers. And we have a variety of actions that we can um, take. This is a slight potpourri of that um, information. Um, within the past year, we have ramped up our enforcement actions. We issued the first um, injunctions um, against e-cigarette manufacturers and also the first civil money penalties, again, uh, against e-cigarette manufacturers. And we also continue to take robust actions among retailers, um, including um, uh, for um, uh, underage sales, um, in addition to 910 violations, which is for the sale of illegal e-cigarette products. I will remind folks that the FDA cannot be everywhere at every time. Um, and so we have to be very judicious with the limited resources we have, and we have to prioritize our enforcement actions. We have to be mindful as well that any action we do take is going to be legally defensible. And so it's a chess match, not a game of tic-tac-toe in terms of determining where we go, when we go, and prioritizing those actions. And so that's what we have done. Um, we are ramping up activities on the enforcement arena on, strong, on top of our already strong foundation. Um, but again, we have to make sure that we're strategic about what we do and when. Um, and I will say more to come when it comes on the enforcement and compliance front. And so I did want to end on public education as well. This is an important component of our portfolio. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, we have the Real Cost Campaign for Youth Prevention that's been in place um, for many years, nearly a decade now, and it has been very instrumental in preventing cigarette smoking among kids um, and a contributor to those very low rates that you saw in that initial slide that I showed. 
But also on balance, we do acknowledge that the landscape is diversified and we have to be nimble and evolve too. And so at FDA, we've done that. And in 2018, after we saw that marked uptick in e-cigarette use among kids, we folded e-cigarettes into the real cost campaign as well and have been doing digital component and media on that um, for many years now. We're also mindful of the importance of health equity as well. Um, that is a front and center priority of the center um, before I arrived and I have um, amped it up. Um, and uh, a good example of this is the Next Legends campaign that was released last summer, um, which highlighted um, uh, prevention activities in American Indian, Alaska uh, Native youth, um, particularly related to e-cigarettes with, with culturally tailored and appropriate um, uh, information and resources to help uh, prevent initiation and use among this population. Okay, so that was the four um, tenets of what our center does. And I do want to uh, broach just briefly looking ahead where we're going. So some folks I'm sure are aware that we had an external evaluation um, from the Reagan Udall um, uh, 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 organization um, that was commissioned by um, the FDA commissioner last year. Um, I wholly welcome that opportunity. Um, being a, a new center director, it's always good to have an external entity come in and open up the hood and, and give you pointers of where we can go. Um, we um, did issue a response earlier this year. We have committed to addressing all 15 of those um, our recommendations and have developed a new website and we report quarterly on all the progress that we're making. Um, that's include things like a new strategic plan through the cross-cutting um, uh, component, a five-year plan that we just had a public um, uh, a meeting on, and also things like science and application application review. We've got another public meeting for PMTA coming up. So it's all part of that important strategy to make sure that we're continuing to improve so that we can effectively regulate tobacco products in the United States. Um, with that, I frequently get a question about, well, how can folks help? Um, there's a variety of things that can be done in the U U.S. regulatory context. Um, one is participate in rulemaking. We have public comment periods for folks to engage um, in a meaningful way. Um, we also um, have the ability to report violations and adverse experiences, including tobacco product violations. Um, we frequently use this information as intelligence to help inform where we go in terms of enforcement and compliance, but also any other actions that we may need to take. Um, we've also got a variety of resources if folks um, want to use those, including education efforts. You can go and see digital media. There's a lot of content that can be used free um, and printed out or used for the web or also downloaded in social media. Um, but it's also important that we continue to conduct research and also public and engage, uh, engage in um, this type of work at the local and state levels. And I know you'll hear more um, from my colleague Mark about that in a bit, but I can't reinforce the importance of that comprehensive collective approach, which has been the hallmark of, of tobacco control for many years and also goes when it comes um, to regulation and, and evidence-based policy. So with that, I will close my mouthpiece. There's some information here um, on how you can contact the Center for Tobacco Products. We are on all the social media platforms, save a few, um, including um, uh, the latest X or whatever we're calling it this week. Um, I strongly encourage folks to um, see our great resources. Um, and unfortunately, I am not on the other end of, of these um, emails and correspondence, but we have a great team of 1,100 civil servants that are working day in and day out to implement um, the authorities afforded to us by US Congress. So with that, um, I'll turn it over and look forward to the Q&A portion later in today's session. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, uh, we have a number of, of questions already. Um, participants, definitely please keep them coming. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have interpretation today. So if I can just ask our, our colleagues to, to please send their questions in, in English. Um, and we'll try to arrange for interpretation for next time. But, but again, do keep them coming and we are expecting a, a very lively uh, Q&A session. Um, we will be sending uh, the, the presentations out via email um, uh, later this afternoon, um, as a couple of, of people have asked. So, so please stay tuned for those again over email. Um, Dr. King, thank you so much again. We hope that you can stay around for, for the Q&A session. Um, our next presenter, Mr. Mark Meany, uh, Director of the Commercial Tobacco Control Program at the Public Health Law Center. Uh, Mr. Meany, the floor is yours. Great. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Ash for inviting us to join you and for putting this this series together. And it's always an honor to be um, on a panel with with Dr. King. Um, I think. When I started in, in commercial tobacco control, I left the, the, the world of private practice for the kinder, gentler world of public health. And within a couple of weeks, I was asked to do a presentation and um, happened to be on a panel with, with Brian uh, a number of years ago. And it turned into quite a, um, an intense experience with um, um, uh, sort of a trial by fire where I think there was some, um, some um, it was, it was, it was an angrier crowd than I think I had experienced before. I think it was almost to the point of, of having tomatoes thrown at us. And I watched Brian uh, smoothly and professionally continue on and was, was completely unfazed by the, um, the, the anger that was, was directed toward all of us. Um, and so I kind of, one, was impressed by his, um, his professionalism and, and two, kind of wondered if I'd made the right life choice uh, to move into public health. But that has not happened um, since then. So um, I'm happy about that. So I'm here to talk about, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on our organization, the Public Health Law Center, and the kind of work that we do. And then as, as, as Brian said, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the policy options that are available um, that hopefully will both complement and, um, and go beyond what the FDA um, has and can do um, to make sure that we are coming forward with, with cohesive policies to really end this commercial tobacco epidemic. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of who we are, I work at the Public Health Law Center. We're a nonprofit, a 51 c 3 We're uh, located at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, we are a grant-funded organization, and we began, uh, we were founded about 22 years ago as a tobacco law center, and we've since then expanded beyond doing commercial tobacco work, and we, now we do both healthy and active living work, as well as um, work in the climate justice arena. This is a, a, a photos of our team. I just encourage you, if you have any questions, um, anything you need at all related to commercial tobacco control policy that you contact us. We have a wonderful group of, of lawyers and policy analysts who are available to help you out um, to provide free legal technical assistance um, you know, on, on, on all your, your, your questions. We are um, concerned we work just um, within the United States, um, so we don't do international work at this point. But um, again, I encourage you to reach out to one of the friendly faces here and hopefully that many have, you know, have already done that in the past. When I came here, I didn't know what legal technical assistance was. So I thought it's, it's always good to start off with um, letting you know kind of what that means and the kind of help that we can provide for you. We do a lot of legal research and analysis. You have questions on the legal validity of a policy, um, whether it's been admitted somewhere else, what the results have been, the research uh, base, the evidence base for it. Uh, we can provide all that information to you um, and help you with policy development, coming up with language that will do what you want it to do. And in a way that is, we hope is less likely to be litigated in the event there is litigation. And we know that we live in a very litigious um, sphere uh, that it's most likely to survive a lawsuit. We develop a lot of publications. We have one of the largest libraries of commercial tobacco control publications in the country. I encourage you to peruse our website and, and um, there should be something on there. And uh, I think that it would be of interest to almost anybody who's here. Um, if there are things that are missing, you can let us know that too. And it gives us an opportunity to, um, to develop some new publications that are that fill, that fill those needs. Then we do a lot of trainings, um, any, any large or small presentations, uh, we can we can certainly develop um, very direct trainings on specific areas that are, are in need for you. What we don't do, and which is um, somewhat maybe unusual for our legal centers, we don't do any direct client representation, so we don't actually litigate cases. We do, though, get involved in litigation, especially when there's a case that has some national significance. Generally, that's through the development, drafting, and filing of an amicus or front of the court brief to ensure that the public health perspective is part of the court's record. But we also help with help attorneys prepare for oral arguments or to just really understand the landscape of commercial tobacco control policy. And then the second thing we don't do is we don't do any lobbying. All of our work, and that's probably true of everybody here, is done through a health equity lens. And we know that we are working in a sphere where we have an industry that has very predatorily and intentionally targeted certain communities. It's mostly the you know, communities that are the most structurally disenfranchised. Uh, and the result has been significant health disparities. And so our job is to really mitigate or eliminate those health disparities whenever we can. So that's the focus of, of, of all of our policies and the work that we do. 
And then finally, I want to mention that when I talk about um, commercial tobacco, I'm really talking about the, the tobacco industry and not the sacred use of tobacco by indigenous communities. And today, when I talk about policies, I'm talking uh, primarily about state and local policies. Uh, these certainly are also um, options for um, tribal nations as well. But because tribal nations are also sovereign, um, they're not as constrained in the same way that state and local governments are. And so I think that's a, it's, it's a larger conversation um, um, about but but um, developing tribal policies and so that certainly it's applicable but it's not directly um, what we're talking about today. Okay, so getting to this is kind of where uh, the, the connection that Brian had talked about on um, this comprehensive collective approach, which I think I like the, the phrasing of that. The state and local governments, in, in terms of the point of sale policies, the the um, authority comes really from these three provisions in the Tobacco Control Act: the Preservation Clause, the Preemption Clause, and the Saving Clause. And what's great is that they're very, they're very clear and they give a lot of broad authority for state and local governments um, to act in this sphere at the, in, in, in terms of point of sale sales restrictions. So the preservation um, says nothing in the act limits state and local authorities to enact um, laws that prohibit the sale, um, regular prohibit sale of, of tobacco products. Allows the um, state and local governments to go beyond what the FDA has or can do. There is a preemption clause that does pull that back. Um, regarding um, tobacco product standards. So it doesn't allow state local governments to establish requirements that are different from or in addition to um, requirements of the act related to tobacco product standards. So that's kind of what Brian was talking about in that left-hand side of the slide, uh, manufacturing standards, um, um, constituents, you know, the um, products that are really on, on the, the manufacturing and, and, um, and packaging side of, of, of um, commercial tobacco. And then the saving clause says that doesn't apply if it's related to a sales restriction. So our reading of that, and um, thankfully, and more importantly, uh, courts have agreed with that, is that this gives really broad authority to state and local governments to enact sales restrictions, really of almost any kind. Um, and that's, I think that's a really important takeaway, because we do hear a lot about the lawsuits, uh, but I think the important piece uh, is that a good policy um, that, that's framed as a sales restriction, that is a sales restriction, uh, is um, very likely to survive litigation. So again, this is this is kind of what Brian had in his his slide with the you know the the, um, the two colors of what what the federal government has the authority and what state and local governments can do, and where there is some crossover. So things like nicotine yields, how the products are are constructed, is is solely under the authority of the federal government, the FDA. Um, some things, internet sales can be can be um, regulated both at the federal and state and local levels as well. The federal government doesn't have the authority, of, so to enact, or, or the FDA doesn't, um, to enact smoke-free laws to um, increase taxes um, or to ban entire classes of products or also to lower nicotine levels to zero, lower them to, as we know, to um, non addictive levels. But all these are, are uh, the, the, the smoke-free youth access, the tax of pricing we'll talk about at a very high level are all very clearly within the authority of state and local governments to regulate. So I'm going to talk about some policies, and again, this is going to be at a high, high, high level. So I'm not going to talk um, in specifics about them. Any one of these would warrant conversation that would, you know, that we, we could talk about for um, quite some time. So, um, and I'm happy to do that in the Q and A later today or at any other point. But I just want to kind of highlight some of the broad breadth of policies that are available to state and local governments. So smoke-free policies. It's still unfortunate that so many individuals in our country live in communities that don't have comprehensive smoke-free workplace laws. And that's something really as a, you know, as a ground zero, that's, 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 that should be, should be rectified. But also um, we are moving forward beyond that. Now we realize that everybody also has, has the right to live in a, a safe and smoke-free home. And so more communities are looking at smoke-free multi-unit housing policies. This has also become more, I think, uh, important to be aware of in, the, um, in light of the, um, you know, now about half the states have legalized non-medical cannabis use. And so in, in some cases that has been uh, used as an opportunity to try to um, erode some existing smoke-free laws. Uh, but I think that you know, all these has to have to be a part of how we're viewing, um, viewing these policies. But smoke-free is certainly uh, in, essentially ex extremely important and something that is, um, is still very, very relevant. Who can sell products where they can sell them to? And again, Brian uh, talked about this as well. Um, for us, it, you know, a lot of this comes out of the structure of a, of a comprehensive um, tobacco retail license. That the structure that under which many of the policies I'm going to talk about 
fits uh, very clearly. So these can be things like you know legal sale age, as we you know talked about, um, twenty one nationally, and um, you know most states have followed that to have their own opportunity to do their enforcement. Um, but many other uh, restrictions on on the sale of certain types of products, where where um, where retailers can be located, all of these can be under a robust tobacco retail licensing policy, and also the the enforcement, uh, which include the the penalties and not allowing people to sell products if they aren't complying with the law. Where a product can be sold, and this is something that we do a lot, a lot of work in. We know that there's that, that there's a lot of research showing that um, exposure, especially among youth, to tobacco advertising results in higher use. So, um, reducing tobacco retailers in residential areas in your schools, um, retailers from distance, distances from each other. Um, tobacco products really shouldn't be sold in pharmacies that are you know that, that run counter to the. Um, you know, the, the, the whole role of a pharmacy in our society, reducing the number of licenses and making sure that, 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 that certain communities aren't overrun and the density isn't, isn't extraordinarily high. San Francisco and New York City have done a good job of that and making sure that they're, they're, um, they're going to have retailers that they're going to spread out in, with, um, around the city and not, not in the communities that the industry is trying to target. Which product can be sold? And I think if we're talking about health equity, we all know, and this is something that's being done at the, at the FDA level, um, and that, but is is you know more importantly in the moving forward at the state and local levels. Um, menthol is a product that should not be you know be sold. You know, it's something the industry has targeted, especially to the African American community, um, with devastating effectiveness, unfortunately. And, and um, you know, I think the the, the, the flavors in, in general, but especially menthol, um, are a clear focus of the work that we are doing and helping draft policies that are uh, comprehensive and. and prohibiting the, the sale of menthol products. And this is something that I think as we see, often what happens is that state and local governments will follow um, what happens at the, the federal level. So when, when flavor policies were first being enacted in the province of New York City about a decade ago, they didn't include methanol. And that's because of the omission in the Tobacco Control Act, which was really um, you know, a horrible omission. It wasn't until Chicago a few years later passed this policy that included menthol in a very limited way just restricting the sale within um, certain distance of, of school and youth oriented facilities, youth oriented facilities that methyl became um, restricted in any way. And then, it, then as, as we know, San Francisco, Massachusetts, and California, and many, many, many local governments have, have uh, prohibited the sale of methyl products and all flavored tobacco products. And I would say it would, the important thing also that is that there has been a lot of litigation. I know that gets a lot of press, but um, there hasn't been no court has found that there's any federal preemption of flavored policies. And so we, we feel like they're very, very strong legal footing. Tax and pricing policies, uh, Brian touched on this as well. We know there, there's a ton of evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of increasing the prices, both on youth who are the most price sensitive consumers, as well as non existing consumers, and helping folks to. Um, to provide an incentive to to um, to, to quit use, and uh, these should always always be tied to culturally appropriate cessation efforts. Um, the tax and pricing policies are clearly within the authority of state governments, especially local governments. Often don't have taxing authority, so using non-tax pricing policies to keep the price up is, is an effective way to do that. And those are things like restricting the use of coupons, reduction of coupons, setting minimum price floors. New York City has price floors for a, a, a number of products. Other communities do as well, but New York City has kind of a whole suite of products, ensuring that the product can't be sold for less than, say, $13 for a pack of cigarettes. And these also can be part of a strong retailer licensing structure that, that I talked about at the very beginning. What we want to do eventually is, is move to the end. We want to end this, um, you know, end, end the tobacco industry's hold on us. Um, and this can be done in a number of ways. I think we're seeing this tobacco, this nicotine free generation policy, both within the United States and internationally, where uh, the, the, the kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying anybody born after the state can't purchase these products. It's a very slow way to phase out the sale of, of products, but it's, it's, it, is, it is one way that eventually it will. Um, eliminate the sale of the products. A more um, shorter term way is what we've seen in, in places like Beverly Hills and Manhattan Beach. And I think in these communities, they said, hey, you know what? We, um, if this product were introduced in the market today, it would not be allowed to be sold, um, especially combustible cigarettes. Um, so they prohibited the sale of tobacco products in, in the communities. And um, 
it has been, um, you know, these have not even actually even been litigated. I think this, this end game policy has, has taken hold and moving um, throughout the country. We're seeing a lot more interest in this. And then uh, one, a couple of things I want to mention real quickly. I think that um, we talked about federal preemption of state law, but I think the, the bigger danger, I think the danger that within you know, it's inside your own home is often state preemption of local policy. We know this, that local policies are the best way to target um, local communities' needs. Um, so they're often the most equity focused policies and um, allow for more policy um, innovation and often local policies are what, what move up towards state and ultimately federal policy. So um, state preemption is is really, really problematic for lots of reasons. Um, and it's an it's industry tactic to, um, to inhibit strong uh, public health measures. And then finally, why, are, why is it important to, to, to have state and local governments um, enact these policies when we already know the FDA is doing, doing some of this? And I think it's important because of their flexibility, the flexibility, the ability to look uh, longer term um, and, 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 and being able to pivot and amend policy at the state and local level is just a lot uh, faster uh, than it is at the, at, at the federal level. Uh, tailored enforcement, you can enforce it, as Brian said, um, um, they can't be everywhere at every time, uh, but state and local governments can, can construct the enforcement and implementation of a policy the way they want to do it. I think that's extraordinarily important. So when we look at e-cigarettes, when we started, we had these, you know, the 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 weird thing with the almost looks like a handheld bomb that's now moved on to something that is almost identical to a highlighter. Um, we want to make sure we develop policies for future proofing them. We're including all of these products um, at once. We know that the, the world of e-cigarettes is enormous. Um, synthetic nicotine. Uh, we knew that was a possibility. It wasn't economically viable a number of years ago. Now it is. And so having policies include all of nicotine um, at this, you know, was, was an important uh, thing that we were doing. You know, we started drafting um, uh, definitions of that number of years ago. Um, and then finally, when California passed this flavored tobacco um, um, bill, um, almost immediately once after they, they put it on the ballot and, and the, the voters upheld it, uh, they immediately created these new sensation products that are they're calling non-menthol, but the user experience seems to be flavored. Um, they package them as if they're flavored tobacco products. And so important to have a, a you know definitions that allow these to also be considered flavored tobacco products by looking at the user experience and not how the uh, what the industry says they are. Uh, again, those are opportunities that that, that um, are because of the um, the ability to pivot at state and local levels, these can be done more quickly and um, to ensure that we don't keep these products in the market. So I will stop there and we can we can um, go to questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mark Meany. Um, excellent presentation. Um, really lively presentations from both, the, both Dr. King and, and Mr. Meany. Thank you so much. Um, we have just about 15 minutes for, um, for a Q&A session. And so um, I, I wanna get right into it because we have so many wonderful questions from all of you. Um, definitely keep them coming, but you know, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, again, we have my colleague, Kelsey Romeo Stuffy, who will be uh, joining us. We may have a few questions that she could potentially help with as well. Hi, Kelsey, thanks for coming. Um, and um, I will, I'll, I'll jump right in and, um, you know, I, I encourage everyone, um, or well, all three of you to, um, you know, if I ask a question of one of you, you're certainly welcome to, um, to, to weigh in and, and respond um, if you have further thoughts. Um, and with that, our first question, um, Brian, this is over to you. Um, you've come out more strongly uh, adopting a continuum of risk perspective, including commissioning investigations on messaging. Um, what are you worried about moving forward with this model, given that it is not inconsistent with a lot of the messaging that the tobacco industry has been adopted recently? They've embraced the terms harm reduction and continuum of risk with somewhat vague promises to decrease the percent of their product portfolio made up by the sale of cigarettes while increasing the sales of e-cigarettes, heated tobacco products, and other non-combustible products. What is, how is your perspective different from theirs? 
Excellent question. Yeah, so I would say that the notion of continuum risk is, is actually nothing new. Um, we've been um, uh, reinforcing this point actually all the way back to the 2014 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report, which was the first government um, Surgeon General's report to acknowledge um, the variation in risk across tobacco products. Um, and it's been reinforced in, in multiple other um, documents as well. You know, I will say it's important to remember to my earlier points um, what Congress has required us to do at FDA. And that involves weighing net benefits of, and risks of these tobacco products and making decisions. And we also have a modified risk tobacco product um, a pathway for applications. And so we are required by law um, to evaluate the relative risks of tobacco products. And that said, based on the science that we do have, um, it's, it's clear um, that there is a continuum of risk. Um, that says, as, as I've noted publicly many times, including in my time before FDA, everything we do has to be based on the science. Um, and so in terms of the recent commentary I wrote for addiction, um, and also the recent funding announcement out of NIH that FDA worked collaboratively, what we're doing is getting the science that we need to inform effective regulation. And so we can't take action unless we have that science. And so we're working to get that information, including the recent funding opportunity to see, you know, what are the impact of messaging on this, about the intended populations like adult smokers, but also uh, among unintended populations such as youth. And so, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's an either or. Um, you can pursue both youth prevention and also um, still reinforcing um, evidence-based therapeutics for cessation, but also keeping in mind that for some adult smokers, um, if they do choose to use an e-cigarette and they transition completely, there would be a net benefit to that individual. So how do we get that evidence-based message and that science to them um, in, in an effective way um, while also not jeopardizing the important work around prevention and, and importantly, first-line defense of, of FDA-approved um, cessation therapies? Um, so I, I don't think it's a new position. It's just we need more science. It continues to evolve. And as a scientist, that's what I'm committed to doing in the new role. Excellent, thank you. Uh, question related to menthol. Um, we know from the tobacco documents and the research that's been shared that essentially every tobacco product contains menthol. Is this true of the new non-menthol products now being sold in California, a state that's recently banned the sale of menthol cigarettes? Um, and is there some level of menthol in these products too? Yeah, so I can't speak to any um, specific product, but I, I will say that this is a topic that's certainly on our radar. Um, when it comes to the product standards, it's ongoing rulemaking, but I would point folks to the proposed rule um, where we were very mindful of proposing a flexible factors approach in terms of determining what a characterizing flavor is, which accounts for some of these factors, including you know sensory characteristics or taste or aroma that may be comparable um, to, to um, you know, menthol. And so ultimately it's important that we do consider the complexity complexities of these products um, in terms of our regulation. And I can't speak to what the final rule um, will look like, um, but I will say that it's certainly something on our radar um, and that we are mindful of. I will also reinforce again that um, you know, regulation occurs in this country at multiple levels, um, and that includes at the state as well. And so we certainly see um, uh, uh, efforts at the state level to implement policies, and that's something that, that should continue. That's why we don't have preemption. Um, but at the federal level, I will say that we're mindful of the complexities of these products and, and uh, more to come once you see the final rules around um, uh, methyl um, and also uh, flavored cigars. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Mark. Um, for those products which have been denied in pre-market review, if we see them being sold in local stores, um, what's what's recommended um, um, for us to do specifically um, at the local level? Well, I, I mean, they, they shouldn't be sold. But I think, you know, as Brian said, their their enforcement um, already they can't be everywhere all at the same time. But I think that, that that's a perfect example of why local enforcement is really, really important. Important state or local enforcement that there is there's better opportunities they they get the structure to have 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 a number of clients checks that they want, um, but those products should be you know it's reported to the FDA but also um, local laws can say that if it's not if it's not a, a, a legal product to be sold under FDA as well um, it's not legal to be sold at the local level either so it's a violation whether it's a tobacco retail licensing violation or um, some other um, aspect of of their state or local law um, there are. Plenty of options um, for enforcing against those types of products. Um, Seeing on the thing here of the uh, state and local policies, in your presentation, um, you stated that state and local policies are most equitable. Could you expand a bit on um, why that may be the case? 
Sure. What I was, I think, what I was, what I was saying is that it's it's often that um, local local governments, especially, um, are the most attuned to the needs of their communities, and so they have the the the, the best um, opportunity to have specific policies that are tailored to alleviate, um, the, you know, the 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 the, 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 the problems that are within their community. Um, so if it's if it's you know. Um, and I, and I think this is this is kind of a multi-layered thing uh, approach, but it, it's um, it's it allows for um, kind of going away from the macro level and look at the micro level and, and disaggregating data to find out you know you know which communities are being the most affected and finding the best approaches for uh, the best suite of policies that are are helpful in um, in mitigating those problems and and um, reducing tobacco use. Um, the other thing that's, that I is what I was trying to get, I think, is at local level is that there's also an opportunity to evaluate the policies and to change them. And to, you know, I think that we, we know that the first time a policy is, is developed, we, we, we learn, we learn from, we learn where the, what, how the industry is going to react. We learn the best ways um, to tweak it, to make it uh, more effective. And that's what that often then happens is those, you get other local policies, which then raise up to the, to the state level and the federal level. So I think that it's just the idea of, 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 Locals know their community the best. They know the best policies that are going to be effective in um, in helping reduce community problems. Um, you know, some of that is in New York City and San Francisco, where they were realizing that certain communities um, are where the where the the, the the proliferation of tobacco retailers were located. So there was, you know, even if you reduce the overall number of um, tobacco retailers within the city, what you end up doing is still having certain communities that are disproportionately affected. And so the you know same thing with exposure um, to to tobacco advertising, the, you know the sales, all those things were really um, were really ended up exacerbating um, existing disparities. And so what they wanted to do is to take each region of the city and lower the number of tobacco retailers within each region. Um, so again, it's, it's something that's very it's a it's a very locally tailored policy uh, that I think can't be done at a state or federal level necessarily because you don't you know you don't have that level of of, of sensitivity and specificity. Thank you. Um, shifting over to to um, I guess some international questions here, um, and, and Brian, we'll start with you, and then and then Kelsey may be able to to jump in and and, and weigh in on this one as well. Uh, is the FDA aware of the progress in the Netherlands to require use of the WHO intense, that's the World Health Organization, intense method to test cigarettes for tar, nicotine, and carbon per not, uh, monoxide? Um, it's a superior testing method to the FTC slash ISO methods currently in use and could accelerate the introduction of the low nicotine cigarette in America. Yeah, so I'd say that we are aware. Um, I'll also say that any processes that we implement for any regulations have to go through the rigorous rulemaking process. Um, and so that takes many years, as we've seen, you know, with the menthol product standard, anytime we do a rule or a guidance, we have to articulate what exactly the testing procedure will be, what are the expectations for industry, and that's something that takes many years, and so I, I, I kind of chuckle when folks are like, oh, well, why don't you release this rule, or what's taking so long, you know, the, these take years to do as part of federal processes, and we also have to prioritize what we do, and so right now we're focusing on the first product standards around menthol, cigarettes, and flavored cigars, and also the nicotine standard, because those are focused on combustibles, which can have the, the greatest impact on public health, but then we can follow thereafter with others, which could include other products. Um, and, and certainly the nicotine testing standard, I agree, could have some implications, um, uh, you know, for the, the question. Um, but ultimately, those are things that have to be part of the rulemaking process um, and have to be um, clearly defined in terms of expectations for testing. So certainly aware, um, but also would reinforce the complexities of the rulemaking process. And, and babies have reached full gestation and shorter time periods than it takes to even develop um, one of those, let alone get it through the process, public comment, and also finalized. Um, but yes, we are aware. Kelsey, any thoughts? Um, I'm an advocate, not a scientist, so I'm not going to comment on the actual testing, but um, we are very aware of it as well and have noticed um, how the lawsuits in the Netherlands are discussing the rigged cigarettes and um, the difference in the testing has been really uh, useful for litigation. So just those two tie together a lot. Yeah. Um, question that, that Brian or Mark, I think that I'd like to hear from both of you on, on this, if, if that's okay. 
Do you see an opening for FDA to ban sales of filtered cigarettes um, as a ban or thinking about banning flavors or will this be left to state and locals? Well, I'll just reiterate what I said, that everyone has their wish list, um, but we have limited resources, limited people, and limited time. And so we have to focus our energies on those actions that, one, are going to be most impactful for public health, and two, are going to pass legal muster. If you look at the cigarette warning labels, we've been tied up in litigation for over a decade. And so we have to be very strategic about what we do and when we do it. Um, we also have to be mindful of what we can and cannot do according to the Tobacco Control Act. Um, and so there's certainly things that have occurred um, uh, internationally, um, but in the U.S., we have to adhere to the Tobacco Control Act, but we also have to prioritize, importantly, what we do and when. Um, as I noted, we're, we're in our adolescence as a center, so we got a lot of years ahead of us, and we're working on a strategic plan now to really map out where we go, um, and I'm hopeful within the next um, uh, several months that will be public and will, will be clear, but again, we got to prioritize on what's going to have the greatest impact, um, and that's not to negate that that could happen, um, uh, but um, just being mindful of, of broaching the, the big biggest ticket items first um, that are going to have the greatest public health impact. Mark, what do you? Well, I, I guess I, I mean I certainly can't speak to or make any prediction on what would happen at the at the federal level, but I do think this is again something where I, there, there's there's no reason to wait for the FDA for state and local governments um, to to move forward in this area. And I think this is something we've seen a lot more interest in in the last few years as we're getting a better understanding of the environmental implications um, of. Of, of cigarette butts that are discarded. Um, and, you know, we've seen bills introduced in a couple of states to um, prohibit the sale of, of filtered cigarettes. And I just, I anticipate that that's going to um, get a lot more um, momentum going forward. Um, so I, I would, I would guess that we're going to see, and which is, you know, generally the case, uh, more, more activity initially, at least at the, at the state and local levels um, on, you know, on this issue. And I think it's, it's a great issue to be, um, for, for well, it's, it's it's a terrible issue for for many reasons because I think we are you know getting a better sense of how how damaging um, these products are. I think that it's um, it's worse than we had we had realized. But also, I think it's just there's a lot of different groups. You know, I think the 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 um, youth environmental movement I think is is not, is is something that it's a way to um, to to generate more enthusiasm for the you know the work that we're doing in, in an area that um, you know that that may have may, maybe not uh, something that they've been is engaged in before. So I think there are a lot of different constituencies that are really interested in this and that, that are very concerned about, um, about, about tobacco product waste. And I think, you know, I think this is gonna get much larger from, from, um, from seed to disposal of the products. So um, thinking a little bit more about um, uh, rules and laws that we do have on the books already, can you think, um, and this is from a local perspective, so Mark, um, can you think of some best examples in terms of, of implementation of some of those with regard to local enforcement? Who's doing the enforcing and what's, do you have any examples of some of the most successful um, enforcement approaches out there? I th oh, I think what we, we believe, and I, I, I think this is, this, I think this, you know, I think this is kind of becoming more of a of, um, common belief, but the, the, the focus of the policy should be on the, the sellers of the products. You know, we we, we want to, um, and, and this is something that the industry has tried to use and 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 get in nefarious ways um, in trying to um, counter things like menthol restrictions and 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 focusing on on the users. All all of our um, policies and all the enforcement should be focused on the tobacco retailers themselves, uh, distributors, um, and going going upstream. So the most successful local implementation strategies. Have been um, done by more of the health department, um, le less than less likely than law enforcement, and have robust um, graduated penalties for the retailer. So um, to the point where they are, you know, the the, the the penalties get stronger to the point where they are um, revoking licenses and not allowing people to sell. I think that you know the 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 that has been the most effective approach, um, you know, from from our perspective in in local enforcement. And a robust enforcement, uh, multiple compliance checks a year, making sure that the, that that um, that there you know that there there is a a, a full system in place. Um, and again, that's something that can't be done at the federal level um, as easily. So it's it's um, and there are lots of examples of communities that have done that that have worked at with using you know shifting away from the police department to the to the um, to the health department. I think that's important for lots of reasons. I think there's a lot of historical. 
um, structural reasons why we don't want and they want the police to be enforcing, um, law enforcement to be enforcing these policies. Thank you for that. Um, we are coming up on times, but I do have one more question. Brian, this is for you, and, and then we'll go ahead and close the session after that. Um, so much has been accomplished by the FDA over the past decade. Uh, but for those of us on the outside of the FDA, it can seem somewhat perplexing that CTP has been in existence for over 13 years, and yet we still don't have a clear horizon, a clear horizon on, on some of the more in-game type regulations that could more profoundly impact initiation and ongoing addiction. Um, uh, and for example, moving forward to denicotinization to non-addictive levels, at least for combustibles, just to kind of name one or two. Um, what can those of us on the outside of the FDA to do to support more rapid progress in the FDA on some of these larger issues? And that was a mouthful, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, completely. And I get it. And I appreciate the question. And I'll reinforce what I said earlier that, you know, it, it's very easy to criticize from the cheap seats when you got nothing to risk and nothing to do. It's very complicated on the inside um, to effectively and strategically navigate the regulatory authorities that we have. Um, it is a chess match. It is not a game of tic-tac-toe. That said, you know, what can folks do? Well, and, you know, instead of dragging FDA, I think really thinking meaningfully about how we can support those important wins when they do occur. And we've got some landmark uh, product standards that are coming out, something we've been talking about for decades um, in the tobacco control field on menthol and flavored cigars, and also the cap on nicotine. These are revolutionary in the field to have great impact. And so instead of dragging hardworking civil servants, let's focus on the fact that we've got a great opportunity in front of us. And this is the beginning. As I said, we're in a very early phases in the history of our center. And once we get those foundations rules through. And once they pass important legal muster, then we can really start to put the metal, uh, the pedal to the metal and accelerate. And so I'm very hopeful um, that we've got a lot of unprecedented opportunity. Um, we've made a lot of great progress. And I'll say just because you're seeing something publicly does not mean that something is not happening. And folks have been working tirelessly for over a decade since I'm here. Um, and I've been a strong advocate on this work for many years. Um, and we're intent on um, using the full extent of our authorities, whether that's product standards or enforcement, but the public Public, importantly, can galvanize and support. Sometimes pressure is needed, but I will say right now, we have never had a more supportive administration for tobacco prevention and control, and I'm committed to using the science to effectively implement the law, and that's what we'll continue to do, and we appreciate your ongoing support by building that evidence base, providing the important support we need for effective strategies, and continuing to reinforce key messaging from the agency. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, I really appreciate um, your, your response to all of our questions. Unfortunately, we, we are out of time um, for today's session. Um, I know that we, we could go on probably all afternoon with all of the wonderful questions that we received. Um, I, I know that you all have shared your contact information. Um, I'm hopeful that we can flash that again uh, before we go. We will be sending out the, the program um, over email later this afternoon. Um, but before we go, I want to mention also um, that our next webinar at ASH will be on October 5th. We'll cover uh, tobacco industry interference in public health policymaking. We'll be sure to share that registration link um, over email uh, later today. Um, Dr. King, um, Mr. Meany, thank you so much again for your excellent presentations. Thank you so much for your lively um, uh, Q&A session that we had. Dr. King, we appreciate the work that the FDA is doing on tobacco product regulation, and we look forward to supporting you as you work towards a healthier world for all of us. Mr. Meany, thank you so much to the Public Health Law Center for all of your fantastic work and collaboration. You're all an excellent resource for the public health community. Um, I also want to thank our production team, um, led by Megan Hicks and, and Megan Manning. Um, everyone at the FDA and PHLC um, that worked so hard behind the scenes to organize this program. Thank you so much. And finally, a big thank you to all of our participants today. Uh, we thank you for your attention, your thoughtful questions and, and your feedback. And we look forward to welcome you, welcoming you uh, to our next webinar again on October 5th. And we hope to connect with you in the meantime.